my name is Matt Davis. We are in my apartment in Paris. I'm a musician and I do some composing. I grew up in Albury, New South Wales, but I, I sort of spent most of my time in Melbourne as an adult. I started a band in Australia called Jersey in 1997. We released lots of records and toured around and toured overseas a bit. And then I moved into sort of film composition and theatre, sound design and composing. And I, st I started a new band, an instrumental band. And now I live in Paris and continuing that journey. The thing I was so grateful for being in Australia was we had total freedom to make whatever we wanted to make. There was no... Because the audience was so limited... <laughs> We, to be frank, we never imagined being full-time, I guess, musicians unless we were overseas. So when we were in Australia, we all had, we sort of, we would maintain day jobs. I mean, I had 15 or 20 day jobs in the time Jersey was going. I'd keep quitting them to go on tour, but we'd have day jobs that would keep us alive. But when it came to making the work, we would just make whatever we wanted. It was never a commercial we never had commercial sort of concerns. So that was, on one hand, annoying, but as far as the art, the music goes, it was so liberating because we could just do whatever we wanted to do. And I think if you look at music in Australia compared to here or compared to the United States or, or the rest of Europe or England, I just think we're just making some of the most fantastic music some of the most artistic music, and it's probably because of that, because we're sort of down there in the bottom of the world and so far away from everyone else, there's a sense of kind of freedom, which is great. Obviously the other side of that is you feel sometimes that you're just making music and it's going into the void. And so getting out and getting international was a big thing for us. Nowadays it's quite normal with the internet to have an audience, you know, in America or Europe if you're an Australian band. But back when we were playing, which is late 90s and early 2000s, it was unheard of to go overseas and to have an audience outside of Australia for a little band. For Silverchair, it was fine. But for a band like us, you know, we sold a few thousand copies of our debut record or something. It was ridiculous that we would go to America or to Europe, but we... We felt like we wanted to do that and we wanted to take our music internationally and we knew the market was limited in Australia for our sort of music. So being in Australia was both both liberating but frustrating at the same time. We were relatively unknown in Australia and, and we got invited to play South by Southwest and we had no money and we had no label in America. Back then it was really important obviously to have a label and to have publicity and things like that, things that... Bands these days probably don't realise were important, but they were totally important back then. So we had none of none of that. We had a manager in Australia, but he didn't really have much international sort of experience. Even our publisher in Australia just said, "We, you know, we think it's too early," and but we just wanted to go. And that experience was the, the defining experience, I think, of the band. It was after the first record, we arrived in Los Angeles four guys in our mixer and our manager and one of the guys' dad. And we hired a van and we drove from Los Angeles all the way down to like South by Southwest, which is in Oxton, Texas, and all the way up that east coast, played in all those towns and then across top of the country to go back to L.A. We did about 8,000 miles in 30 days and we played to practically no one and we lost so much money and it was on any, you know, accountant's spreadsheet, it would be an absolute disaster, but it was an absolutely defining trip for us, full of defining moments. There was a night we, we were in El Paso, Texas for some God, I, don't, I have no idea why we were in that town. We didn't have a show, but we were there. And we walked to Mexico that night, you know, because it was El Paso was dead. It was a Tuesday night, 
And someone said, well, the, we're right on the border. You could go to Mexico, you know, Juarez, which is the most dangerous city in North America. You could go there and, and it will be alive. And sure enough, we walked to Mexico. And so that ended up being a song on the second record. And it was terrible, but absolutely fantastic. And the band was so tight. We played better than we ever have. And we wrote basically our second record on the road. And and that, that trip stands out to me as like the best moment. I mean, we played much better shows. We played, we toured with Pavement, we toured with Wilco, we played with Flaming Lips, we toured with Mogwai, we played with great bands in Australia and we had amazing times. But that American trip, you know, playing to eight people in Toronto, it's just like that was, that was where we became a band, I reckon. I always want to do more. I think everybody, every artist thinks that they could do a lot more and that we're procrastinators by nature and all the good artists are really down on themselves and think they could be better, of course. But I, I am a fairly pragmatic person and I, I don't really believe in inspiration and I don't believe in divine intervention or the muse necessarily. I think there's part... There's, there, it can happen. Things will come to you in the middle of the night and or sometimes you just have something comes to you and it's fantastic and it's you don't know where it came from. But I'm much more from the pragmatic school of just showing up and I believe in a daily practice. I'm totally about a daily practice. I can't do one day on and one day off or one day on and three days off and then start again. It has to be completely daily for me otherwise it doesn't feel right and I find that if I'm daily then things happen things will come to me where I just know they wouldn't if I hadn't been going daily and just turning up even if I turn up and I I try and write and nothing happens for four hours then that's fine I just call it a day but then the next day I go again and something will happen for me people like Woody Allen are my sort of inspiration he said things like, you know, plenty of people have got good ideas, but who's willing to do the work? And I just, for me, I'm willing to do the work. I, I'm not a great guitar player. I'm certainly not a great musician in any way, shape or form, but I turn up and I know that just that act, that something, something great might happen. Culturally here, being an artist is a valid vocation. It's completely respected and that, that that would be your job. In Australia, the standard response in my experience when I was speaking to sort of regular folk, when they say, what do you do? I say, I play in a band and they go, oh yeah, what else do you do? So what do you do for money? Which in Australia, I guess is a valid question, but here that just doesn't come up. They just, you say you're a musician, they go, oh, great. When can I see something or when can I, can I see a show or when can I hear a record or whatever you do? So I think culturally from a very young age here they instill this idea of art being a valuable aspect to life, an important, integral part of life. You know, we have a little kid and she's two and they talk about art at her creche, you know, and they take kids as young as three to like, you know, contemporary art galleries and talk about Rothko. I mean, it's ridiculous. It's fantastic. Being an artist here is just just the idea that that would be respected by the general populace, by the shopkeeper or the accountant or the lawyer or the politician. Is it, it, That does encourage you because you feel like you're not on your own in your little studio trying to make your crappy little songs, you know. There's, there's other people involved. There are other people that, are, that appreciate what you're doing. Having our little girl... It's wonderful, obviously. It's amazing. But it's certainly changed my practice. She's two. She's just turned two. And really, in two years, I haven't made anything, really. I've done a few little jobs. And I've written some songs and I did a film or two. But, but really, my art practice completely stopped. <laughs> completely stopped. Jane, my wife, is a writer and an actor and so we're being both artists. 
we, you know, we've shared her first, the two first two years of her upbringing, I guess. It's not like I've gone to work to my studio and Jane stayed home. We've shared her, her supervision, I guess, and her parenting. As a result, neither of us really have done anything of significance. We haven't made anything of great significance. We've worked and we've got things happening, but it's certainly been challenging the last two years. Amazing. And I have this feeling that, in fact, the work that we're doing now as we're coming out of this sort of coma, baby coma, I think the work we're doing now will be grander and and more developed and more human and more beautiful than anything we've done before, purely because of being parents and purely because we've touched this greater love than I ever thought possible, you know, and every parent I think will understand that. There are some really practical things that are great about having a kid. I get an hour and I'm just like, I'm like Robocop or something. It's like 60 minutes and I'm on. Because I know at, in one hour she's going to wake up or I've got to pick her up or or Jane's coming, Jane needs to go somewhere, you know. So there is there is one thing, it sharpens your focus and and being a pragmatist, that appeals to me actually. I think it is possible to be an artist and be happy. I don't subscribe to the tortured artist idea. I think that's bullshit, actually. But that's my personality too, because that's the pragmatist in me. I don't agree with that sort of, you know, is Tom Waits tortured now? You know, maybe in 1974 he was, but he's not now, and he's making the best art of his life now. Totally it's possible to be an artist and be happy. And I I think making art is 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 about truth. It's about conveying truth in some way, in a sublime way. And certainly there's some amazing art that's been made from pain. Incredible. But I think that's about the truth, not so much the pain. I mean, for me, I'm a musician, so I listen to records more than I consume other forms of art. But I listen to records like Alice by Tom Waits, and I just think that's just just an absolutely sublime piece of art, and it's... And it touches pain and it's comments on it and it melancholy at parts. But it's also theatrical and joyful and mad. And I think that's a true artistic document. Marketing and self-promotion, I think, is the great challenge for me and probably most artists of my generation. So I'm 40. In Jersey, we started in 1997. Grunge was still kind of around and then into the 2000s and we're from the indie rock sort of, you know, we wanted to be pavement basically. So that, you know, for us the idea of self-promotion was totally on the nose. We just, it was anything that you did that would promote yourself in any way, shape or form was just completely frowned upon. And I think... I need to get over that. I'm living, I'm kind of, I'm the, I, I understand that I'm the outsider now in that, with that idea. From time to time I do sort of, I mean like everyone, I think you sort of, you come up against a bit of a brick wall. Maybe you keep repeating what you've done before or you just not, what you're doing is not really hitting the mark for you. And to get through that, there are there's just lots, there's just so many great artists out there that can help you just tap other parts of you or to get through that point. I mean, there's a few that I keep coming back to, definitely. There's a book, Woody Allen on Woody Allen, which I think is just like, it, it's like a mini arts, arts course. His, his attitude to making art, I think, is just totally fantastic, totally pragmatic but in love with the idea of making work and love in love with like true art. And of course, not all of his films are good, but that's not the point. 
The point is that he's made like 70 films or whatever. It's ridiculous. The fact that he keeps going and keeps making these films, it's just, I find that really inspiring. I love all these artists that just keep making work and putting stuff out. So just that on itself is totally inspiring to me.